Okay, third time's a charm. Third time's a charm. This is going to work this time. I'm Hospice Nurse Julie. I'm live at five every Wednesday. You think I would understand how to use my equipment by now, but I don't. I don't understand. <laughs> I don't know what's happening, but I keep getting on a different thing and then it's black and then it records, but I don't see myself. So I'm just waiting now for everyone to come on because I keep doing stuff wrong. Welcome everybody. Hi, Abigail, who's a CNA here in Idaho. Thank you for being here. You are the first one here. It's just me and you. No pressure. <laughs> but um, I think I'm confusing everybody, unfortunately, because I keep going on different like channels to go live. And I'm so sorry about that, guys. I don't know what is going on with the live. Hi, everyone. Hi, Ms. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Tyler. Tyler, you're always so great. Thanks for coming every week. Hey, Jill. Hey, Teresa. Hey, Megan. You're so great, too. Thanks for coming every week. Tim, Gina, Christina. High Flyer, Wicked, Ins uh, Wicked Insanity, uh, OR Scrubs. I mean, everybody here, Sandra, Janet. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Sorry, I'm always a little late and I'm always having technical difficulties. So the first question from High Flyer, how do you deal with, uh, how do you deal with death every day? Is it difficult? So one, I don't deal with it every day. But when I did, when I was like really a full-time case manager, people still aren't dying every day but they are, I guess, in the process. And really, uh, for me, the best thing I did was really create good boundaries within my um, where I worked. So I would say no if I couldn't do things. I work for a unionized company that has unionized nursing. So we have a union that can fight for us and give us like rules. <laughs> so the administration can't just like flood us with a bunch of stuff that we can't get done in one day. So then you feel like you can't really care as much as you want to. And then I really have a good work-life balance, which is really hard to do with nursing, but I um, have worked for years to do that. And because of that, I feel like I, um, I don't get depressed or sad. And also because I was an ICU nurse for so many years, I really believe in hospice. I really believe in it. So I feel like if you're going to die, it's one of the more peaceful, better ways to die. And we are going to die. So it's not like we know none of us are going to experience, we're all going to experience that. Hey, everybody. Hey, Amy. Hey, Julie. I did forget my large poster. I've, I've been traveling um, to Long Beach to be on the, the Queen Mary ship, which was really fun. Welcome, everybody. Come on in. You, we just started. I was a little late because I kept going on the wrong live. I don't know why I can't figure out like computer stuff. Can you talk a little bit about the veil comes down, the dying sees realities? Okay, so Tom Jensen says, can you talk a little bit about when the veil comes down and the dying see other, other realities and old past friends? Yes, that is something we can't explain. Like if you just want to just purely talk like scientifically, right? If it, nothing to do with my belief system or why it's happening or religion, I just got to really really mean email from somebody being like, your video triggered me. You talk about religion, keep religion out of it. I never talk about religion in my videos. Never. I never talk about a religion. So just all aside, visioning is something that does medically happen to people at the end of life. Not everybody, but many, many people. Um, and they see dead pet, the, dead pets that they recognize, old friends that have died, parents that have died, grandparents, brothers, siblings, you know, siblings, fr um, friends, I already said that, spouses. And we don't know why it happens, but it happens enough that we educate about it. And it usually happens a few weeks before someone dies. So it's usually not like drug induced. It's not because their oxygen levels are depleting, nothing like that. Um, and it's a phenomenon that happens at the end of life that we don't fully understand. I've seen it so many times. Anne's a retired ICU nurse. That's so amazing. Can a uh, can a person get kicked out of kicked out of hospital? And what happens after that? A person, yes, you, you would get you don't really get kicked out, but basically, if there is no more they can do for you, um, they will eventually be like, you have to leave. 
the hospital. Now, people can also get kicked out of hospice um, if they can no longer prove to Medicare, who's essentially our boss, um, that you still have less than six months to live. So people can get kicked off hospice. People with dementia do, Parkinson's, uh, CHF, COPD. <laughs> Kathleen, everyone's wondering where my poster was. I love that everyone's wondering where my poster was. My poster has my book on it. Nothing to fear, demystifying death to live more fully. If any 100 of 60, 161 of you guys haven't heard about this yet, I'm sure you have because uh, I talk about it enough. Uh, I wrote a book and it's out June 11th um, and it's out for pre-order now. So if you haven't bought it yet, if you haven't pre-ordered it, if you're interested, it's out there. You can pre-order it at hospicenursejulie.com and you can get any kind of form of book you like. Oh, thank you, Abigail. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for, thank you, Bob. Hi, hi, Bob. Um, Kelly says my mom is 88 years old and has, has a bad heart recently. Her blood pressure is very low. She's been sleeping more each day. I'm wondering if this could be a sign. Um, it's really hard to know. I mean, you'd I would have to know how bad her heart is. I would just talk, even though I know it's really annoying, I would discuss it with her doctor just to see. Because it might not be. My mother is 82, was placed on hospice about three weeks ago, metastatic liver cancer with primary likely ovarian. Yeah. She's weak, confused one day, then super talkative and alert the next. Yes, very normal, Christina. So Christina is saying her mom's on hospice. It's been about three weeks. She has metastatic cancer, which means cancer in different parts of the body. The primary source, meaning the cancer likely started in, in her ovaries. So ovarian cancer, metastatic, meaning move to the, the liver. Um, she's weak and confused some days, very normal, especially with anything associated with the liver. Uh, and then super talkative and learn other days, also normal just because of the waxing and the waning of things. My, uh, I always just push, you know, you're not always going to get specific answers on hospice, like why everything's happening. But as long as your loved one is like clean and they're safe and they're comfortable, try to just be present with them and enjoy the time as hard as that is. I realize it's a, it's a hard thing. It's not easy. It's simple, but not easy. All right. My question regarding earlobes folding back a few hours prior to passing, my husband did, and he had the fish out of water breathing maybe two hours before then went silent. Yes. So people talk about the folding of the ears that can happen sometimes at the end of life. Um, I do not see it that often. The only time I see it was when people have very, very friable skin, meaning like very, very thin, thin, thin skin, usually because they're elderly. And, um, a lot of people with dementia, probably because of like malnutrition and stuff, not because of anyone's fault, but because that's just how it works. They sometimes will get these like really, really thin, thin, thin earlobes. Like see how my cartilage here is like nice and thick. It's like their cartilage starts kind of wearing down and it gets really thin and their earlobes can kind of like fold over. So, but it doesn't happen with that many people in my opinion, but it does happen. What can I expect from a friend who has stage four kidney disease? Debbie, that's very hard to answer because you could expect many, many things. If they're on dialysis, just them being really tired and busy because dialysis is three times, a day, three times a week and they're going to be, and then it wears you out. So they'll have good days and bad days. That's the biggest thing. If someone is dying from kidney disease, that means they've been on dialysis. Usually it always, it always depends, but usually that means they've been on dialysis for quite some time and either they don't want to do it anymore or their body can't handle it anymore. And they stop dialysis. Usually someone, if they have advanced enough kidney disease, like very, very, very end stage, they will come onto hospice and they die within seven to 10 days. It's very, very peaceful. They usually just are sleep all the time until they die. Um, the main symptoms are confusion and itching. But other than that, it's like a very, very peaceful death. Can I insist on tumor removal by surgery when my doc, uh, when my doc something chemo first is best? Gina, I would listen to experts. 
I can't give you medical advice. I'm not an expert in, in uh, can't, I'm not, a, I'm an, I'm an expert in hospice and palliative care. I'm not an oncologist. I'm not a, I'm not a, a cancer expert. I personally, if it were me, I would listen to what the experts are saying. Doctors are experts. They see this day in and day out. If you don't like exactly what you hear or you don't like the oncologist specifically or the surgeon specifically, then go to a different one and see what they say. But in general, I would listen to specialists in this area. They know much more than anyone else. <sighs> okay, welcome everyone. Welcome everyone. I'm just looking through, I'm doing my best to read the questions. I'm going down to the list now. I had to skip a few, but if I, if I missed yours, just write again and put it in all caps. Uh, I'm just going to read through some of the things I'm seeing here. Yes, you do usually lose tons of weight when you have cancer, any type of cancer. Usually. In addition to hospice care, do you, if so, how do you help family with um, coping with grief? I struggle coming to terms with loss, especially from death. So um, my, I don't know if we're talking about my book. My book does talk about um, grief and how to, how to, you know, how to deal with grief. Um, also, if your loved one west of Oz just died on hospice, if they did die on hospice, you have a year's worth of bereavement services that are for you if you need to. Um, and I would strongly suggest group therapy for grief. I know people really don't like it, but I feel like it has to be, uh, it's really, really helpful. Do hospice nurses make sure they don't get sick, aren't sick, aren't sick before being around the patient? Yeah. Any, any nurse should not be sick around their patients. That, that is, that is because hospice patients are more susceptible. Yeah. You don't want to be, you don't want to be like a sick nurse around your patients. I never go to work if I'm sick. But also you have to remember that people can sound sick. That doesn't necessarily mean they're contagious. Like you can be sick and be contagious for three to five days or whatever. Right. But then after that, you might have like a, like a scratchy sounding voice. That doesn't necessarily mean you're sick because you're not contagious anymore. When a person is about to pass, do they usually experience trouble breathing before they die? When a person is about to die, do they usually experience trouble breathing before they die? No. So especially if you're dying on hospice and natural death, many people think their loved one is gasping for air, having trouble breathing before they die, fish out of water breathing. They look like they can't breathe, things like that. That is not, that, that's the, the person, uh, anyone actively dying on hospice, meaning like the last phases of life when you're dying a natural death, which is what hospice is. I'm not talking about someone who's been shot, someone who's had a car accident and is suddenly dying. Not that. Um, someone who's choking. Not that. I'm talking about someone who is on hospice and is dying naturally. Now they're dying from a disease, but they're still dying the natural way, meaning we're not intervening to make them stay alive, right? On machines and such. When that happens, the body takes care of us by metabolically changing and shifting. There's a bunch of chemistry that's involved. Um, a bunch of biology, like a bunch of things that are involved that I'm not going to go into. Everything I try to explain, I try to um, explain as general and as basic as possible. So like anyone can understand. Um, but it is very um, like there's a bunch of chemistry involved. Our, uh, but so our so metabolically we shift um, and then our body starts breathing differently on purpose to help us shut down. So things are shifting in our blood, which is making us breathe different, which is why at the end of life, when you don't, you're not used to seeing someone die. No one is because we hide it from everybody. When you see them having changes in breathing, you think they're suffering. You think something's wrong. How do you know? That's the next question. Well, how do you know they're not suffering? Maybe it is really bothering them. You know, because one, you're, I'm around it all the time. Anyone who works in healthcare, you, you know, you become an expert in the field because you are working around it all the time. You see it all the time. And someone who is having trouble breathing and is aware of it <laughs> will make that known to you. If they can't physically, they will 
if they can't physically tell you, they will show you through their body language. They will, I have seen people who are breathing differently and they feel like they can't breathe. They look panicked, their eyes are out, they're grabbing at you, they are panicked because they feel like they can't breathe. When someone is dying and they're unconscious and their body is changing and they're breathing differently, whether it's chain stoke breathing, like gasping or fish out of water breathing or barely breathing or taking one breath every two minutes, but they also are not really conscious and they're not waking up, that tells you that they're doing the natural thing. It's very normal. It's very natural. There's no suffering. It's okay. That is why I show those videos that I get so much, I get in trouble for when I show real life videos of someone actively dying. So people can look at that video and go, oh, okay, that's normal. And I can explain why and how it's normal. And then when they see their loved one do it, they don't have to feel as afraid. So the, that's a long-winded no. Most, I don't know your exact circumstance, but if they're dying a natural death and you see them having changes in breathing, no, that's normal and to be expected. I hope that makes sense. Um, if you go back and watch any of my real life actively dying videos, it might help you too. Ted says, question, my father has graduated off hospice twice. Is that normal? Yes, that is normal. That is normal because there are certain diseases where it's really hard to tell if someone truly has six months or left to live. And some hospice companies are willing to kind of take a risk and be like, well, it might not, he might not really meet criteria. He might be kind of borderline appropriate, but we'll put him on for six months. We'll see how he does. If there's no decline, which is good, but if there's no decline, we, can, we can't really prove to Medicare he truly belongs on here. And we're audited a lot by Medicare. So they'll take the person off. And then something will happen usually. They'll get another infection. They'll have a fall. They'll go into the hospital. And then they go back on hospice again. Maybe they'll stay on this time for eight months. And then they have to come off. So it is pretty normal. Oh, thank you, Nikki. Nick, Nick Taylor says, you've been advertised in one of our local newspapers in the UK. The website is Birmingham Live and your book got a mention too. So pleased for you. Oh, me too. Thank you, Nick. It's so funny how like, I don't even know that happens. People, thank you for telling me because the people who publish me don't even tell me that. Sorry, I'm just looking through stuff. If I didn't get to answer your stuff, um, please just um, re-ask in all caps. Um, I Rising says, I just lost my mom. She was uh, in hospice at home. Please share if a hospice patient can drown from excess fluid while turning if they're on their back for too long. Oh, okay, yes. So let's, I'm gonna, I Rising, thank you so much for caring for your mom. And I am going to kind of give a lot of answers to this. So a lot of times when, so when someone drown on ex excess fluid, right? So let's talk about the fluid. People can have a lot of fluid because they are creating, their mouth is still creating saliva like we all are right now. And now I'm unconsciously swallowing the saliva because my brain's telling me to, and I have muscles right here that work. At the end of life, your body is still creating all that saliva, but these muscles are weak and relaxed and your brain is not really communicating to any parts of your body that well anymore. So that stuff collects right there. So it creates a gurgling noise. No one is drowning on that fluid. No one's drowning on that fluid. So that's one point. The second point, can you drown on that fluid if it's right there and then you lay the person's head back? I would say you could technically, I wouldn't say drown, but you could technically aspirate, meaning some of it could go into your lungs. Now the person's probably so unconscious, they wouldn't even notice. It wouldn't really harm them much. But what I would probably do if it was really excess, um, I would keep them kind of head a bit up. And if you were trying to take the secretions out, uh, with a, if you weren't using medication, you could just turn them on their side while sitting up and let the fluid come out. It's not always as easy. Sometimes you have to use a sponge. Sometimes um, 
you can use medication. I just did a whole video about this actually. So you can go look at my, uh, go, go look at my page. So could they technically choke on the fluids if you just lay them back when they were, when they had like uh, that gurgling noise? Technically, yes. I don't think that happens that often. Um, but I do have a whole video about how to make sure you don't do that. I hope that answers your question, at least a little bit. I have not personally taken care of somebody who is on hospice. No, I've had a lot of people die in my life, but not on hospice. Is it unusual to ask that close relatives are not present during the actively dying phase? I don't really want my wife and children to remember me that way. <clears throat> um, you could ask that. I would talk to your family first about that, though, to make sure that, I mean, I guess it's whatever you want. But also, if you're at home and they're your main caregivers, that won't be able to happen unless you pay someone to be in the home caring for you. Now, if you plan on going somewhere else and having the like a hospice home take care of you or nurse, a nursing home take care of you and they just come visit, then you could talk to your family and say, listen, when I'm actively dying, I don't want you there. You could do that. But if they're going to be your caregivers, that will be impossible because they have to care for you because they have to change you, at least change you and keep you clean and give you medications if you need it. I hope that makes sense. Do you have videos for people who have end stage kidney disease? Yes, I do, Teresa. I would like to know what to expect. My husband is fine now. Just wanting to give a heads up. Yes, Teresa, just go look at my, through my videos and it will say like what to expect when dying from end stage kidney disease. Um, and I will say um, it's it's it usually takes a while to get there, right? Especially if you're doing dialysis, but it is a very um, it is a very peaceful death, but it can, it will happen quick once you decide to not do dialysis anymore, if you're on dialysis. How was hospice during the pandemic? Great question. It was, I was like thanking my lucky stars every day that I was not in the ICU because the ICU was horrific. I heard, oh, sorry, I'm cracking my neck. And it was okay. You know, the horrific part was me fearing that I was going to give COVID to my patients. That was one part, you know, they were dying anyway, but the last thing I wanted to do was like give them COVID then have their family get COVID. But we had a lot of family members get COVID and, and die. So not the patient, but people who were caring for the patient got COVID and then died and then they didn't have a caregiver. So a lot of stuff like that. Is it normal for your eyes to change color after you pass? Yes. So I just, I did a video about this too. So your eyes, I don't normally see people's eyes changing color. Um, and I used to be able to like rattle off exactly why, but basically there's like some kind of liquid in between your lens and your cornea, I think. And when you die, that kind of thickens up and is absorbed into your cornea. And then it makes like a cloudiness over the eye. So a lot of blue eyes turn gray or black and brown eyes turn black as well. So I don't see it a lot, but that is that does happen and that's why. For dementia patients, Monica, hospice people, like hospice professionals are usually looking at the FAST score, F-A-S-T not the cognitive score. Because by the time that you are on um, hospice, you're cognitively, I mean, you're mostly nonverbal. So uh, we don't know. So that's not something we technically look at. We look at the FAST score, F-A-S-T. And usually by the time someone is a seven A, B, C, uh, A, B or C, usually seven C, for sure you can come on hospice, but that's very, very debilitated. So just Google the FAST score, F-A-S-T. Welcome everybody. Again, I'm Hospice Nurse Julie. Thank you for being here. Don't forget to hit that um, heart button in the corner if you like my live and subscribe if you like what you're hearing. I am live at five every Wednesday, Pacific Standard Time. And if all 255 of you don't know it yet, I do have a new book out. It's called Nothing to Fear, Demystifying Death to Live More Fully. Nothing to Fear. 
Um, if you want to check it out and pre-order it, it is um, on my website at hospicenursejulie.com. It is out for pre-order. Um, it's out June 11th, but pre-orders help me. So if you're if you plan on buying it, please do, baby. I mean, please pre-order it because that that helps me. Oh, Nathan, thank you for being here. I'm sorry about your aunt. Thank you so much for being here, though, honey. My dad is on morphine. How should it be given? And does it help with all the pain? What is morphine exactly? Morphine's an opioid. An opiate? Opioid. I think they're both the same. Uh, so it's our narcotic. Um, but it, I think, um, how should it be given? You need to talk to the doctor for that. How often should it be given? You have to talk to your doctor about that, Ted. I can't tell you because it depends on how the doctor ordered it. And it will help with pain. It also will help with shortness of breath. Jennifer says, I sat with a gentleman that had Parkinson's, was on hospice. He was running fevers, not eating, drinking. His urine smelled terrible. Could have been, could it have been a UTI? It could have been Jennifer, but it could have been he was also dying. So at the end of life, people aren't eating, they aren't drinking, their urine smells because they're dehydrated and they do run fevers. So it's hard to know. If he was fully unconscious and couldn't swallow, I wouldn't worry about a UTI because he can't swallow antibiotics anyway. And would the antibiotic really extend life? Not really, right? It depends how far along someone was. Now, if he was like walking and talking and fine, and then all of a sudden not eating and drinking and unconscious and running fevers, then yes, we should get him to the hospital and get IV antibiotics because he probably would perk up and be fine after IV antibiotics. So it just depends on where the person is in the stage, their stage of life. Do you know what I mean? Do you have videos on dying with Parkinson's disease? Um, I do. So just look for what to expect when dying from Parkinson's disease on my videos. Um, a lot of it is like dementia, if I'm honest, because I only see people with Parkinson's and dementia when they're very, very advanced. So they are obviously very different diseases, but at the end of life, they are similar. Um, Julia. Oh, Nathan. Okay. I just saw. Yes. Thank you. Hi from Portugal. Cool. My six-year-old passed away from DIPG. Any experience with this disease? Oh gosh. She was unconscious for her passing. We used Keppra and morphine. Yes. This hopefully gave her peace. I don't have any experience with that gym because I don't take care of any pediatrics, pediatric hospice. I've never done pediatrics in general, but I will say um, that does sound like a typical treatment, Keppra and morphine. I'm so sorry. Thank you for being there for your daughter. Thank you for being there. And thank you for being here and being willing to talk about that. I'm sorry uh, I haven't had much experience with pediatrics in general. My mom, I do know that pediatric hospice, I don't know if she was on hospice or not, but it's different than adult hospice because you can still get treatment and be on hospice if you're a child. Whereas with hospice as an adult, you can't be receiving any kind of like curative treatment and be on hospice. Ooh, Monica is a hospice nurse. Hi, Julie. I've been a hospice nurse for eight months now. And thanks to your videos, I've become more knowledgeable and sound more experienced than I really am. <laughs> Monica, you are experienced, girl. You know what you're doing. Oh, my gosh. I'm glad my videos could help. And thank you for being a hospice nurse. Your patients probably love you. That's amazing. Thank you. Do you have any experience with near-death experiences? People who are pronounced dead and come back, reading a book on it. I don't have any experience with that, Tony, because unfortunately, <laughs> this is not funny. I don't know why I laugh. It's not funny. But I was just going to say, unfortunately, all my patients die and they stay dead. Truth. Um, but I do love hearing about near-death experiences and none of my patients have had that. I did have that one patient that was, and I have a video about this, it's called my miracle story. One patient that was very close to death. I mean, very, it's a miracle that they came back because there was no way they could cognitively have come back. Their brain was definitely not getting oxygen, things like that. So they were very close to death. And then the next day they came back to life and uh, lived another three months, which doesn't sound like a long time. And it's not a long time, but it is when you think someone looks like they're going to die that night within the next hour or so. 
So um, I had that experience. She did not talk about experiencing anything like a near-death experience, um, but she could have and just didn't tell me. That could be that could be a thing. Oh, New York says, Julie, my wife was really nasty in her last two months of life. Always yelling mean. Is that normal? So if she had dementia or Parkinson's or MS, I would say yes. Or anything to do with the brain, brain tumor, anything that would change the personality, that would be normal-ish. It doesn't have to happen, but it can happen. The other reason why it might happen if there was nothing with no brain involvement um, it could be because, um, she was in pain. And so it's really hard to be like happy and okay. It's like really easy to go to this like agitated state if you are constantly in pain or having issues with that. Um, if like your symptoms aren't controlled, you could be irritable. So I'm curious to know, let me know New York, if I can see, you know, what kind of disease she had, if you don't mind. And thank you to all my memberships, everyone who has like a blue star and a green name. I don't know if you guys can see that or just, I can see that, but they are all part of my membership program. And it's so nice to see you guys here every week. It seriously means the world to me. And thank you for everyone talking to each other in the comments. It's just so beautiful. Welcome everybody. Welcome. Yes, that Julie, that's the one where she was eating pancakes in the morning. Yes. Is it hard to see someone take their last breath in a hospice? Dante, to me, I would say no. To me, because, because it's not my mother, my father, right? I know it's different when it is because the grief is so present. But when it's not present and you are there, to it feels, and I do not mean this in a religious way. So I mean this in a very secular, our bodies are amazing. We, there is something greater here feeling because it feels very sacred. Like whenever I would see a baby being born, which I haven't seen like often, but I have seen some babies being born, that feeling of like, whoa, <laughs> and now this baby is here and you're kind of like, everyone's crying, the baby's crying, people around it are crying because it's like, whoa, all of a sudden this like new life is here. That is actually the same feeling. I'm getting chills right now. That's the same feeling that I get when I see someone take their last breath. There is still sadness and grief all around from the family members, but I can also feel the sacredness or like the greatness or I can't really put words, but it, it feels like a birth, if that makes sense, which it might not, <laughs> but that's the only way I can describe it. Hi, Julie. Um, can bipolar medications help people at the moment of death? Um, I guess they can help, right? Maybe not at the moment of death, not the moment of death, but if someone is bipolar and dying, they should stay on their bipolar medications as long as they possibly can swallow because that's like, going to help them uh, mentally. But once they stop swallowing, they probably will have to stop that, but they'll usually be unconscious by that point. And then um, they won't need those medications most likely. Oh, Charlotte says, I have worked with hospice for a long time and was not upset when my husband died suddenly. Charlotte, thank you for all your work. And do you feel like that's because of all of your hospice work? Um, Native educator says, thank you, hospice nurse. Julie, my 90-year-old dad passed away a year ago and your videos were a great help to me. Oh, thank you. When he reached, when he reached the final moments of life, I was prepared to lead. Oh. Thank you. That seriously means so much to me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being there. And thank you for being here and letting me know. Messages like that really mean the world. They really help because I do get like weird messages from people being like, screw you. <laughs> I hate you. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I try not to focus on those. I really don't. I totally ignore them all the time. Uh, but so it feels so nice though to get really nice messages. How can doctors be encouraged to place patients on hospice sooner? Education, education. They need, edu they need education. That is how. 
I know you've talked about this. My daughter's best friend died last week only in hospice for a couple days. So it could also be, I don't know how, how old your daughter is, but the younger someone is, the harder it is to get them and their family to be on board with hospice. So it's not necessarily always the doctor. It's not. But I do think oncologists, radiologists, surgeons, intensivists, I think they all need to really, really have a good understanding of hospice. Um, yeah, but I know it's hard. It's hard for them too. I don't want to act like they're, it's all their fault, but I, they do need education big time. I've had doctors reach out to me. Uh, I had to block them because they were like trolling me on the internet. And they were doctors. I looked them up. They were doctors. They were like trolling me being like, hospice is a hell hole. Hospice kills people. And they were, it was a real doctor. <laughs> It's insane. I mean, that's very few and far between, but still. Thank you for everyone who's telling me their stories and saying stuff in the comments. I do see those. I'm just not reading every one of them. Thank you so much. Um, can you really drown someone from giving them a lollipop swab? My aunt's mouth was dry like a cat's tongue. She clamped down on it, but the nurse told me I could drown her. I wish nurses were better at, I mean, not, not nurses in general, people need, anyone needs to be, needs to learn how to communicate to people. So technically, yes. And they need to educate a little, they need to like elaborate. So one, when someone's, I always tell people to do mouth care, get a super wet sponge and make sure their tongue is not super wet and their gums are, or their tongue isn't super dry. Their, you know, their lips aren't dry. Their gums aren't dry. You do want to moisten those things, but there is a reflex. If you put something in someone's mouth, even if they're almost dying, they will bite down and suck. It's a reflex, just like a baby. They're not consciously doing it. It's a reflex. If someone has truly lost their ability to swallow, they're dysphagic. They have dysphagia. That means that they truly can't swallow even if they wanted to. So when they do swallow, or at least try to, that the fluid can go into the person's lungs and then they can choke to death or they can drown in that fluid. They might not even choke to death. They might just like cough and cough and cough and kind of feel like they're choking, which is scary, but then eventually it would clear up. So technically, yes, but you just got to be careful with it. And some people, I would say, you can't put anything in their mouth. But very few and far between. And if that was the case, I would educate fully why they can't. So that's probably what she meant. Hey, Michelle. She was 40. Sorry, I'm just seeing people's responses, D. Witt. She was 40. Yeah, that's so young. That's probably why she was only in hospice for a couple of days. I don't agree with that, but that's probably why. My husband, oh, Vega rocks. I hope you're still here. My husband passed from pancreatic cancer. His ankle swelled a few days before. He had uh, he was cachectic, had a heart failure from anorexia, had very little societies. Oh, sorry. I thought you were asking me a question, question Vegas rocks. I just sort of started reading that. Charlotte, who's also a nurse, said, I've never seen anyone drown from a lollipop swab. Same, Charlotte. I've never seen any. I, I have seen people cough because it's kind of like they're trying to protect their airway, but I've never seen someone drown. I always recommend oral care and keeping someone's uh, tongue and lips moist. Always. Even if they, even if they have dysphagia. I have not taken care of young children in hospice. No, I only do 18 and above. Karma will happen. No, I have not treated someone with those kind of diseases. I have the neurological diseases, but not that one in specific, uh, specifically. Good job, Shannon. Thank you, everybody. I'm just reading through the comments best I can as we go along here. Okay, so um, let me see what's going on. Uh, 
Oh, great. Yeah. Monica says, Monica Rose. I recognize your name, girl. Uh, I recently took care of a hospice patient with CHF in a skilled nursing facility. Yes. Uh, his regular staff nurse believes I hastened his death by over-medicating with morphine and Ativan. I don't believe that's what happened. Agreed. So I do see this a lot and there is nothing, nothing. I have nothing against skilled nursing facility nurses, but I will say, or no, not, but, and I have nothing against them. I think they're great. It's a super hard skill to work at a skilled nursing facility. I couldn't do it. Um, and I do see that a lot of misinformation, they have a lot of misinformation about death and dying. Um, the, the nurses, very few nurses, you know, kind of like combat with me about like stuff, but the nurses that do are all from skilled nursing facilities. And they say stuff like people who are actively dying have to have morphine. People who are actively dying are suffering. Um, and that we hasten death. I've seen, like, I've gotten in like arguments, <laughs> friendly arguments, but arguments with other nurses, because I'm blowing my mind that they're a nurse and I'm, and I'm telling them like, no, that's wrong. <laughs> that's wrong. Here's why it's wrong. You know? And they'll, they'll still be like, no, they, they'll be like, especially the hastening death thing. Like they'll be like, oh yeah, I know you say that, but you and I both know we do. And I'm like, girl, no, we don't. <laughs> you and I both don't know that. Oh, no, we don't. No, we don't. It's actually been clinically proven. It's been clinically proven that morphine, especially on a hospice level, like the way we give it and how much we usually give, is not hastening death. It's clinically proven. It's just helping the person die more peacefully. They both die the same. Like both groups died basically the same amount of time, but the one with morphine just died more peacefully, easily, not quicker. It does not hasten death. Yes, it can hasten death if you're shooting heroin in your arm and you overdose again, no judgment, but like people think it's the same. It's not the same. And we're giving it buccally. So it's absorbing through the gums and the body's not processing it as well as it should anyway. So like all of it is like, we're not giving that much. And people usually overdose when they're not used to something and then they take a lot of it. Hence why people who abuse drugs will overdose. Right. So it's, there's, it's, it's different. Um, and yeah, I hear that a lot too from other nurses. And it's like, I know. Oh, that's good, Charlotte. Welcome, everybody. 343 of you here. All right. And a lot of you guys, members, look at all the members. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I'm not seeing questions coming through. I'm sure I'm just not seeing them yet. So I'm just waiting for more questions to come through. If you've been asking a question and I haven't been saying, answering it, please write in all caps um, so I can see it. I come here live at five every Wednesday, um, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Here's a question, I rising. What if you're turning a hospice patient over to the other side for comfort? Um, but you can't flip them quickly enough and they start to choke. How quickly can a person drown? Not quickly. I rising. I don't know if this has happened to you or if you're just worried about this. If you're worried about it, I would say don't be. Uh, if it has happened, um, I would love to, it's, it's so hard to know without like being there. Right. But I, I wouldn't say that's a thing that really happens. Christy says, can you please talk about the family giving um, a dying person permission to go? Yes. Some people do seem to like kind of hold on until the family is like, it's okay. We love you. It's okay. You, you, we're going to be okay without you. You can go. It's not always the case, but it's sometimes the case to let someone know that you're going to be okay. They can go. Mm hmm my mom died in 2019 from a massive stroke. One moment she was talking, the next moment she went crazy trying to kick, bite, hurt people. Do you know why a stroke would cause this behavior? It could be something where some part of the brain was instantly kind of cut off, like the frontal lobe or something, which controls um, like personality and impulsivity. If that's suddenly cut off, 
that they could turn impulsive or they also, are they trying to like tell someone something but they can't because it's not, they don't know how to anymore. But that's sort of me just guessing. That's the first thing I thought of though, is like the frontal lobe being cut off. So they can't, um, so that the, the impulse, that they have no impulse control and their personality is kind of gone. Um, how to have your, um, sorry, hold on. Thanks, Vera. Hi. Do you believe they can feel our wishes for them even though they can't hear us? I do think that, and I do actually think they can hear us. Hearing is like the last sense, sent, sense to go. So we always say talk to your loved ones. We do think um, hearing is the last sense. Does oxygen prolong life? No, oxygen does not prolong life. Oxygen does not prolong life. Your lungs have to be functioning for it to pro prolong life. I suppose if you had like COPD and it's helping manage your symptoms, it could kind of prolong life, but, but, but ventilators, like being intubated and having a machine breathe for you, that can prolong life. Oxygen, schmoxygen. I don't ever, people, we overuse oxygen hardcore in hospice. But I also don't think it's really going to like hurt anybody. So it's like if people like it, it makes them feel comfortable or I'm always like, it's fine. It's not going to keep them alive any longer because their lungs aren't functioning. So you can pump all the oxygen in there you want. But if it's not, if they're not breathing that great, then it's not going to matter. So no, I don't think so. Yes, Julie. Julie says, my, d my dad has a fear of dying. I'm going to read your book first. Do you recommend your book for him? Definitely. Anyone who has a fear of death, definitely. My book would be for them. Knowledge helps with fear. Knowledge helps with fear. So it's a book that's about, you know, it's educational. So everything you hear in my videos is like in my book, but written. Right. And then, so you're not just like reading a textbook, which to me would be torture. I added in um, stories and things. So it's like entertaining too. And it's not meant to be, thank you, Vera. <gasps> Vera gifted one of my memberships. I love when you guys do this. I love when you guys do that. That's so nice. It's so nice. Thank you, Vera. You are so nice. Are you still friends with Oprah's clone? Who's Oprah's clone? Who's Oprah's clone? I want to be friends with Oprah. Who's Oprah's clone? Yes, Marie, who said, can you point me to the, um, can you point me to the morphine study? Google morphine study. If you Google morphine study, or I'm sorry, hospice patient morphine study, a bunch of papers will, will come up. You have to like, I think you probably have to buy them, but if you want to read the whole article, but they'll give you like the summary of the synopsis. But um, you could actually uh, buy articles if you want and then read them. But there's a few studies done. There are studies done too on like, can they hear us at the end of life? There's different studies. Oh my gosh, Vera, you're so great. Is there a link where I can allow gifts? Michelle, I have no idea. I have no idea <laughs> about the gifts thing. People who like send gifts or like pay me money in the live. I literally have no idea how people do it. If you are interested in my book, though, um, because I'm going to get off live here soon, if you are interested in looking at my book or seeing what it's about or pre-ordering it, seeing when it's out, um, it's out June 11th, and you can look uh, look and buy it if you want or pre-order it at hospicenursejulie.com, hospicenursejulie.com. Julie says, I don't even see where you can become a member. Julie, I wish I could help you. I know it's my page. I know it's my page and I don't even know. I bet one of the members knows maybe. I literally have no idea. I'm so sorry that I'm like this. Um, Abigail, I'm going to be getting off soon and this question will take too long. So can you talk more about TIAs and what happens in dementia? Go, I have so many dementia videos um, I, if you haven't watched them already, I would go back and like watch, watch the dementia videos. So what's hard with dementia is I only see patients who are very end stage of dementia. So they've had a good 10, 15 years before coming to me. So the part that I don't know, which a lot of you guys probably want to know about is that 
10 to 15 year span of like what that's like. And I feel like that's actually harder than like the death part on hospice because this part, the 10, 15 years is where personality changes. They start forgetting, you know, it's hard, 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 hard. It's hard. Yeah, so Tons Jammer, Tons Jammer 69 says, my mom's 83, has been living with Alzheimer's since 2010. She's physically healthy, but how long does someone realistically live this way? Re usually 15 years, 15, but sometimes depending on the kind of dementia or Alzheimer's, it depends. But if she's physically healthy and eating and stuff, who knows? It can it, People can live like that for a very long time. What about the last stages of COPD? I have a video about that just because I'm going to get off here soon. So I have a video on that. So you just go to my page, Hospice Nurse Julie, and look for what to expect when being placed on hospice or what to expect when dying from COPD, which I know those words are harsh, um, but I think it's important to like speak them so we can like loosen the grip of fear. But you can find videos just like that. Chemo can kill you faster in the last stages of cancer. Yes. Oh, Carol. Carol just gifted five people my membership. My members are so amazing that they keep just gifting people memberships. I love you guys. Thank you. And pretty soon I'm getting enough members now. I have to look at the exact number that I'm going to do just private lives with you guys. I'll make sure I tell you before I do it. David West. Oh no, David says he has a problem to comment in here, even though he has a member. I'm so sorry, David. I don't actually know. I don't know. I don't know what the problem could be. I have a problem just getting on live. Okay, you guys, it's six o'clock. I have to go. It's almost not long enough, is it? Live at five every Wednesday, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I will be here. Thank you to all my memberships. <laughs> memberships. Thank you to all my members. Thank you to everyone who has joined. Thank you for all your questions. Thank you to all my subscribers. Um, and thank you to all my gifters. You guys, you're just so amazing. Thank you, everybody. I'll be back next week. Wednesday, live at five Pacific Standard Time. And if you are interested in looking at my all the videos, please do that. My website's hospicenursejulie.com. That's where you can get my book. And thank you guys. All the love to you guys. Seriously, just make my day. You make my day. All right. Love ya.